from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hillary Fuchs, Dollar. How's Mrs. Wendover? So far, so good. Dollar, can you talk? Yeah, sure. She's in the other room. Do you think she's all right? Mentally, I mean? I think she's all right enough to get by. I think she's scared to death of something or somebody. That business of the curse? Yeah. You know there isn't anything to that. There's something to it for her. She thinks she's somehow responsible for her husband's death, for her father's death, and for her brother's death. On the way here, she mentioned just like that that someone else was going to die. Or words to that effect. Who? I don't know. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tears of Night matter. It had started as a routine investigation. A claim filed for $50,000 on the death of Noah Wendover, Miami Beach, Florida. The question, why the two-year delay in making claim? The answer turned out to be interesting. Briefly, it involved a distraught woman who had neglected not only the insurance, but everything else in her life for two years. A woman obsessed with the idea she was a curse. Do you like soda or water? Uh, Soda, please. Thanks. Cheers. Good luck. Mm. What's your name again? Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, that's right. Mr. Fuchs introduced us, didn't he? Do you think he'll be able to straighten out all my business affairs for me? Yes, I think so, Mrs. Wendover. Including the insurance? Including the insurance, yes. Well, you're worried about the claim, aren't you? (laughs) Well, I'm paid to worry about it. I'm not so worried now as when I first came to Miami Beach. I think I understand why it took all this time for the claim to be filed. You mean you've met me and you think I'm kind of... You know, not all there or something. Well... I suppose Mr. Fuchs explained how badly I've managed things for the last two years. He showed me how you've let your affairs go to the devil, if that's what you mean. I'm glad you finally turned it all over to him. I think he'll take care of it for you. I behaved rather badly in Mr. Fuchs' office, didn't I? Well, I wouldn't say that. Poor Mr. Fuchs. He was frightened, I think. I don't know what it is, really. I mean... He mentioned that you were in town investigating my claim on Noah's death. I felt I should talk to you. That's why I had him call you. I wanted to tell you about the curse. There's no such thing, you know, Mrs. Wendover. I know. I know. I couldn't have been responsible for Dad's death. It was a heart attack many years ago. I was away at school in New York. And Jim, my brother being killed in Korea, I couldn't have had anything to do with that. And Noah... Oh, I loved him very much. I'm not cursed, am I? No, no, you certainly aren't. All of these deaths around you have been tragic, doubly so, because you seem to have been very fond of the people. But you aren't responsible in any way. I like you. You're very nice. If you have any questions you want to ask me about Noah, I'd be glad to answer them. I really would. I'm all right now. Really, I am. Well, when we left Mr. Fuchs' office, you talked a lot about that curse business. Yes, I'm ashamed. Were you still thinking of that when you spoke to me in the car? Did I speak to you in the car? Yes. You know, I can't remember riding in the car at all. I've been standing here talking to you, and I've been wondering all this time how we got here. (sighs) Do you mind if I help myself? No. No. We drove over together from Hillary Fuchs' office. I drove you here. Oh. Oh. Some things I just blank out. I've talked to a psychiatrist, you know. I mean, I've been under treatment for several months. He says I established a strong pattern when Noah died of shutting things out, of just forcing my mind to become blank. He's trying to help me get over it. What did I say in the car? 
You said you were cursed and you wondered if he would die. Oh, dear. Who's he? Teddy. Teddy, uh... Teddy Davis. I'm going to marry him when he asks me. Uh Oh. And I know he will. I love him very much. Well, why do you think Teddy might die? Because of people dying around me that I love. He doesn't believe in the curse, does he? Oh, no. He's something like you, in a way. Nice. He makes me laugh at it. He says it's ridiculous. Because it is. Somehow I feel comforted. Now, look... You marry this fellow the minute he asks you and forget about being cursed and everything else. He'll take care of you. Well, I better go now. Mr. Dollar. Yes? Thank you. I need sometimes very much to talk to someone like you. Thank you. J. Dollar, Oracle. Go out and marry so-and-so and live happily ever after. I like the little kiss she gave me. I like the way she squeezed my hand. I like the perfume she was wearing. I like the way the intense, hard brightness had gone out of her black eyes and she was just a nice woman being a woman. I liked all that. What I didn't like was the idea that she could be the other way, believing in the curse and believing she was somehow responsible for people dying. When I left her, I knew that part wasn't ended. I knew it would come back. Come on in, Dollar. I sort of stuck around wondering if you'd come back here. How is she? She's okay now. Fuchs, I'm sending in my report on this policy tonight. I'm recommending they honor it. I've got enough verification. Okay, that's fine. I sure appreciate your help on this, Dollar. Let me buy you dinner. No, no thanks. I'm getting the first plane back to Hartford. Why not wait until tomorrow? You've got a reason, haven't you? Yeah, I guess so. Mrs. Wendover? Oh, I've met people like her before. Don't ask me where or when, but I've seen them. And there isn't anything to a curse but... Trouble seems to follow them. Big trouble. My business here is practically finished. I just want to get out and get away. Can I use your office for about an hour? Sure. It's all yours. Dollar, I feel the same way. I spent a half an hour typing up my report on the Wendover claim and another ten minutes on the phone asking for an airplane back to Hartford. They said they'd call me right back and I poured myself some of Fuchs' whiskey and sat down to stare out at the night. Lights burned up and down the white beach. People strolled up and down, looking at the water, holding hands. And I was sitting alone in Hillary Fuchs' office, waiting for a phone call and thinking about a curse. Hi. Hi. Who are you? Anybody else here? No, why? You were kind of late. So do you. What's on your mind? You? Costigan wants to see you right away. I'm supposed to take you over. Whoever Costigan is, tell him he doesn't want me. You don't tell Sam things like that. You know, it's been a long time since I shook in my boots when a skinny hood like you stood around acting tough. If you've got some business with Hillary Fuchs, look him up at his home. This is Fuchs' office. You're behind his desk. You'll do. Now, come on, mister, and don't show me how loud a certified public accountant can growl. I just might swing this thing on your head. (laughs) That's better. You got a hat? No. I know Costigan wants to talk to you, but I'd sure like to belt you on just for the practice. I'm not Hillary Fuchs. Come on, let's go. Hey, yo! You're going to break my arm! I'd like to, just for the practice. Now then, this Costigan, is he the one from Chicago? Uh, Sam's been there. Answer. The Sam Costigan kicked out of Chicago a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. What does he want to see Fuchs about? The Wendover Dame. What? Something about the Wendover Dame. I don't know what it is. He just wants to see you. Okay, what's your name? Frank Scanlon? Here. You put this thing in your pocket. Pull it out again in front of me and I'll brain you. Now, let's go. Huh? Now I want to see Sam. Well, sure. Sure. Anything you say. I followed Frank Scanlon out of the building to a waiting car. A black packet with side curtains. It was a nice touch for this day and age. But it didn't make much sense. None of it did. It was illogical in the beginning, middle, and end. Most of all, I didn't make much sense. I should have been in my room packing. Instead, I was on my way to see an old-time grifter and hoodlum named Sam Costigan. Because someone had mentioned the name Wendover. You want to smoke? I use my own. Suit yourself, fella. Scanlon was a thin one with sharp, narrowed eyes. Too much padding on the shoulders, too much snap to the brim of his hat, too much point to the toe of his shoes. The 38 had taken away from him and handed back made a considerable bulge in the front of his coat. About six miles out of Miami Beach, he turned off the main highway onto a dirt road. 
About a mile of that and up ahead, we saw lights. The lights became a fine old colonial mansion, every room aglow. Two or three guards were watching the entrance to the front. They all needed shaves. No one said anything. Yeah? It's me, Feely. Oh, this here is Hillary Fuchs. Uh, Sam wants to see him. Come on in. How are you feeling, Mr. Feely? <laughs> what kinds of punks are on nowadays? I wouldn't get frisky with him if I was you. He's a pretty touchy fella. It's so. Yeah. Oh, this way. Come on. He led me into the main foyer where a hat check girl with a lot of red hair stood ready for the evening's business, which hadn't begun yet. On the right, what had been the dining room of the old house was now a circular bar that could seat 25 or 30. To the left, in what had been the parlor and library, I counted two craft tables, two roulette tables, and two blackjack stands. Beyond all this, on a screen porch, a five-piece combo made music. A few tables and head waiters stood around looking bored. Scanlon led me upstairs, and we stopped in front of a wide white door marked private. I thought he was going to knock. Instead, he whirled around very quickly and stuck the same old 38 about two inches into my ribs. Now let's stand steady. Feely! Eddie! You giving you trouble, Frankie? Nah. I, uh... I will, Buster. I'll give you plenty of trouble if you want it. Hear how he talks to me? I'll crack him up a little for you if you like, Frankie. Nah. He got business with Sam right now. We'll take care of our business with him later on. However you say it, Frankie. I just wanted you to remember that. I will. The same way I remember a dirty newspaper story. <laughs> Know something? I'm looking forward to you. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there is a curse that goes with the Wendover name. Goes wherever it is. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Thank you.